What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars, which ended up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. So check out that interview. P90X founder, Tony Horton, he talks about how he made money as a street mime before he's, that's how he made money for food and rent. And Manuel, I look forward to talking about what, what your, some of the dark stories there. Um, and that's how he made his money originally, and he then went on to sold, you know, sell hundreds of millions of dollars. Baby Einstein founder, a founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell talked about how he was, when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve Jobs offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why Nolan said no at the time. And so this is about how people overcome big challenges in life and business. And um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. We do that through a couple done-for-you services. We do done-for-you event solution for large conferences and software companies. We have a done-for-you podcast solution, which in my belief is the best thing I've done for my business and my life. Um, help me connect to amazing people and a lead generation solution, which is not paid, which Manuel will talk more about. This is customized outreach via email um, or any Facebook or LinkedIn, customized messages, individual messages. Um, we do have a greater purpose and mission behind what we do. Um, and we have a scholarship, which is rise25.com slash mission. And it's because my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, escaped from Nazi Germany. Him and his brothers were the only people to survive from his entire family. While that was happening, my co-founder's grandfather was a B-17 captain, did 35 missions over Nazi Germany during World War I. So we want to honor, or World War II, we seek to honor our grandfather's legacies with a scholarship. And so for any of the events that we put on throughout the country, we do a veteran entrepreneur scholarship where it may be an all-expense paid trip or maybe a comp conference ticket. So if you know of someone who's a veteran or you yourself are a veteran entrepreneur, go to rise25.com slash mission. Um, I'm especially excited. Um, we have today Manuel Suarez. He's founder of AGM, uh, which stands for, I love this, Manuel, uh, stands for Attention Grabbing Media. Because I am a I geek out on direct response marketing copywriter, and so <clears throat> everyone needs attention grabbing something, right? And he has a full service social media marketing agency. He runs and has successfully founded several eight figure e commerce brands. And he went on to help his father, Frank Suarez, into a leading force in the field of alternative medicine, which he turned into seven different companies. Um, after people learned what Manuel had done naturally with his own brands, many approached him for help, and AGM quickly grew to over 50 staff. You can find out more at agmagency.com or learn some of his social media trainings at manuelsuarez.com slash mini courses where he actually has trainings and what is working today. Manuel, thanks for joining me. Awesome. I uh, love the intro, Jeremy. appreciate it. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you. Uh, and uh, just trying to get uh, your audience to uh, be inspired. Uh, I'm always looking for inspiration myself. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity out there, and uh, I love uh, having opportunity myself to spread my story and talk about how uh, I've come to where I'm at today and tell you guys a little bit about that. So definitely yeah. excited to be here. You know, and oftentimes when you see the media and people are talking about all these big successes they have, and, you know, it's really an overnight success after 10 or 20 years. And so I love hearing some of those areas where we struggled before people see what they see today, right? And um, I wanted you to start off, I know before we were talking a little bit, and you said there's a dark background looming. Mm. Absolutely. Tell me, tell me about that. It's funny how uh, you talk about the uh, uh, people looking for that big break, Jeremy, right? Like all the time. And uh, I actually made a video about this the other day because uh, there was a, there's an idea out there that uh, you somehow get lucky and a big break 
dawns and you suddenly can explode the clouds open and the heavens come down and all that oh right? my god yeah. that is one of the biggest myths out there i mean i can tell you that i have been pushing really really hard for years to get to where i'm at today i i just think that i'm getting started still um that's a reality i'm just i'm 38 years old and i'm i'm the early stages of my evolution a lot has happened, come a long way. I've been able to accomplish a lot of success, uh, but there's no such moment that I can tell you there was a one big break. It's a, it's an accumulation of accomplishment of targets, Jeremy. It's an accumulation of every single day you do a little bit more, every single day you get a little bit closer, and that's how you get that quote unquote uh, big break. For me, uh, like you said, I was telling you a little bit about this before we uh, hit play, uh, but I come from a, pretty dark background. Uh, that background includes two bankruptcies, uh, Jeremy. One of them is a bankruptcy by my family when I was eight years old and my family collapsed completely from mm -hmm. having a successful business. My dad had a very successful business uh, in Puerto Rico founded by my grandfather. It's called. It was called Suarez Toy House. This is before the Toys R Us era. Mm -hmm. And uh, Toys R Us, um, funny because right now Toys R Us <laughs> was put out of business by Amazon, but we were put out of a business in the 1980s by to Toys R Us. Really? Yep. At 1989 uh, or so, we actually were dominating the Latin American market. Uh, my dad uh, and my grandfather, they had stores. Uh, we had distribution of toys all over the place. Uh, every single uh, super food uh, chain store, uh, they had racks of our toys. And we were making a lot of money with it. It's a it's a company that uh, was founded from zero to in its prime doing over ten million dollars a year. In that time, in the 1980s, ten million dollars is a lot of money, right? So we were very successful. Uh, my dad didn't handle things correctly. Uh, they he had overspent, which is something that I would tell you that I learned lessons from that in the past. That's for sure. Uh, and when Toys R Us came in and revolutionized everything. We started losing a lot of business, and in the 1980s, uh, 89 or 1990, we lost um, pretty much 80% of our business due to Toys wow. R Us coming into Puerto Rico. And at the same time, my dad and my mom decided to want to kill each other. So it was it was all coinciding, and it was a massive volcanic eruption of my family in which we got both parents uh, to hate each other, get divorced. Hmm. Um, and that's uh, funny. Today still... They still don't like each other very much, Jeremy. <laughs> That's the reality. Uh, but I come from a family of four kids. I was the youngest one, and uh, we managed along the way. But in 1989 or so, they got divorced. My dad went bankrupt. My mom went bankrupt, and we had to start over. So we had poverty for many, many years. Poverty, meaning mm. that barely able to meet ends meet. I couldn't afford private school. I couldn't afford um, any activities. I never traveled. I never went anyplace else. My mom kept on battling, trying to survive herself. And that was a, a big, big part of my life, my teenage years. So that led me, Jeremy, for me to try to find other ways to feel better about myself. And when I was uh, 13, uh, in Puerto Rico, this is a big deal. Uh, it's a small island. It, there's a lot of it. I was introduced to uh, to drugs, and mm. uh, I spent my 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 young adulthood, um, my teenage years, from the age of 13 to the age of 20. Uh, I think somewhere around the age of 19, I started uh, getting out of that. But I spent a lot of years. Uh, those six years, uh, for anybody that has gone through this process of uh, being uh, addicted to drugs, it's about 60 years. That's what it feels like. Mm. There was a lot of destruction. A lot of damage, a lot of people affected by it. I used to be a good tennis player. All of that got destroyed. And um, I didn't get through college. I didn't, I barely graduated high school just because I was cool and people liked me. So um, I managed to have enough affinity between my teacher and I, the only one teacher that was going to flunk me, that she eventually gave me a passing grade mm. and I was able to graduate high school. But Learning and having uh, degrees uh, in college were never a part of my my process overall. So that was basically my teenage years. At the age of 19 or 20, I started getting help by my church. And um, I started getting out of it. I met my wife when I was 24. And I never went back to drugs. But um, it's funny because that's a period of uh, life that is very, very blank of a lot of uh, 
heavy, heavy drug usage overall. So, you know, um, at that point, Jeremy, I can tell you that at the age of 24 and 25, um, I got married. I, um, my wife got pregnant right away. And then we moved from Mexico because at that point I was living in Mexico City. Uh, another story for another day, but I was living in Mexico City. And um, we moved to the United States. No money. Uh, she had a job. Uh, she made enough money for us to, quote unquote, qualify for a uh, mortgage. I think that at that time, uh, which uh, a lot of you, your listeners, and you are going to recall, this was in the 2006 environment, 2007 environment, in which uh, we had the subprime market in the United States. I bought a house that we couldn't afford. Uh, no down payment, no money. I think that um, going back to my... my um, that moment, which I didn't understand macroeconomics yet, no education on my side from that, right? Um, I think I was probably one of the last few people in the world, on the United States, to buy a property in the U.S. market before it collapsed, the whole mm. thing. Um, so I lost, again, I lost everything again, once again, reboot, now as an adult. Uh, 2010, bankrupt. Um, and uh, this was a personal bankruptcy between my wife and I. So that was nine years ago. And at that point, it was not only about myself, Jeremy. I, I now had uh, three kids, uh, including a baby that was just born. And I just had to find a way out. And I just kept on looking. Um, I think that all throughout my life, uh, I thought that I was supposed to be a failure, uh, mainly because um, my mom thought that I had to go to college to be successful. Uh, also because uh, my society, the environment, made me feel that the only people that are supposed to be successful are the ones that are going through the educational system. And if I didn't go through the system, I'm not supposed to be successful. So I was stupid enough that I agreed with that viewpoint. So it was almost embarrassing because people would ask you, so where did you go to school? Where did you graduate from? And uh, I didn't graduate. I didn't go to school. I have a nine to five job and I'm, I'm an employee. So for me, at that point, I started learning. I, I think one of my first books that I read uh, in 2011 when I was like, okay, it's time to change, was um, funny enough, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Jeremy. Uh, by, it's a great by one. Yeah. Uh, and that started just waking me up to the opportunity. Even though I, I invested in a real estate um, learning process, I failed at it. Um, I ended up buying a, one property between me and my partner uh, and uh, we tried to flip it. It was a failure. It was a total mess, right? And then we learned about stock markets and option trading. Total failure also. Stock market and myself, we don't match really well because I am historically compulsive. Uh, I drop cups all over me. I flip tables. Uh, you know, something that fluctuates so much doesn't really match with a stock market personality. You know, <laughs> it doesn't really go together with that. So for me... Uh, I also failed at that. So then in 2013 was when things started to get really bright because I got introduced to something that I was really passionate about. And that was uh, the online world, social media. Uh, one of the first things was uh, uh, I got introduced to Amazon. Oh, wait a second. I can sell products on Amazon? So you're telling me that Amazon is not just the only sellers there? So for me, it was a big wake up. And I started looking at that. And um, for me, the last six years have been skyrocketing. So that's, uh, I guess, my story summarized in a few minutes, uh, Jeremy. You know what? Um, I, you were just on a roll. I just want, I have uh, many questions that were down, but I'm not stopping this guy until he, st he takes a breath. So, Manuel, thanks for sharing that. And I want to just dig in a little bit deeper here and we could talk about fast forward, you know, when you discovered Amazon and in e-commerce and the online world, but I want to dig deeper into, there's so many, so many gems you talk about here. And, um, one of it was the, um, years that you were on drugs. And I want to know, how did you get out of it on the other side? Cause it's like you said, okay, from, from your 13 to 19, you know, some people never get out of it, you know? Um, what did you do at the time to actually pull yourself out of it? I mean, that's a, it's a long time to be um, actually in a pattern, right? Right. Yeah, it's six years is a lot. That's right. It was a, it was a process uh, that lasted for quite a while. And uh, it's one of those things that, um, you know, like I, I remember thinking about, 
the idea of quitting drugs was so terrifying. Just could not think about not have them in my environment, right? So for me, uh, my dad had found um, um, a, a, a philosophy. And that philosophy, a lot of you guys have heard about, it's called Scientology. And uh, I actually got um, introduced to it back in um, uh, around that era. And I already knew about it, but I didn't want to form part of it. Uh, it got to a point to me, Jeremy, that when I was uh, when I turned uh, 19 years old, my dad called me on my birthday and uh, I was very miserable and I was an unhappy individual. I used to work as a waiter, uh, which I used to make good money uh, doing. I used to make two or three hundred bucks a night. I used to work on a restaurant called the Para Club in Old San Juan. And I had a little apartment in Old San Juan and I quote unquote, enjoyed my life. And, uh, but I wasn't, I was very unhappy. I was very lonely. All my friends that I have throughout my drug years were not really friends. That's the reality. None of it, none of it were. I actually have one friend still to date who was my high school friend my whole life, who was always trying to get me out of that world. Mm -hmm. And he's still my friend today. But when you live in this world, it's not really friends. You know, people are good and they're good around you, but they're all going for the same problems and nobody's really your friend. So I was really, really alone at that moment. And um, I remember that my dad called me on my birthday. It was a very emotional moment because I was disconnected from the world. I was disconnected from my people, people that care about me the most. And he said, son, I just want to wish you a happy birthday. And I said, thank you, dad. And then uh, I hung up and two minutes later, I broke down. Mm -hmm. And I started crying and I started feeling very sad. And I called him back and I said, Dad, I need help. I'm ready for help. I'm ready to accept it now. All right. He actually picked up his things. He went to pick me up. He took me out to lunch and we started talking about uh, getting help. Um, he presented to me a technology that had helped him in the past because he himself, he was a recovered alcoholic from his own past. I mean, this guy right now today is a powerhouse, social media superstar with millions of subscribers and booming businesses. But he was an alcoholic. Uh, that's what I re remember from my dad growing up my whole life. I didn't really have a dad. My dad was an alcoholic, big time. Uh, and um, so he presented me this technology. This technology was going to be uh, where I could go. I had to disconnect from the environment, Jeremy, because I was in, in Puerto Rico surrounded by the whole environment that I was having trouble with. And uh, and then these people that were around me who were my friends, quote unquote, uh, would just keep on showing up in my environment. And I couldn't stop myself mm -hmm. from coming back in. So one of the things that I would tell anybody that's trying to get out of it is that the number one thing that you must do if you want to get out of a trap like this, because have, make no mistake, it is a massive trap. That's what it is. If you want to get out of that, you cannot get out of it unless you change the environment. You got to move someplace else. You got to go somewhere else. You got to go to another country, another mm. city, somewhere else. If you do not, you're going to keep on being reminded about what that felt like, and you're going to want to come back to the same environment. So my dad sent me off to um, an organization of our religion, which is Scientology, in Mexico City, and I went there, and I, I went through some processes, some technology, a system, to get myself to stop having my attention in that area. Mm. I did something that they call the purification rundown, which is a process that you do uh, to get your toxins out of the body, and um, things that are keep on, that continue to pull you back into that whole world, and I never came back to Puerto Rico. That was it. I never came back. Mm. Uh, I go now every year, and I have my family there, and I, um, I have some friends, and I have all kinds of people, and we have a business. But at the age of 20, because I turned 20 by the time that I went to Mexico, I said goodbye to drugs. I took my stuff. I went to Mexico. I stayed in the organization. I met real friends real people that took care of me, that actually provided a lot of value, and we helped each other out. And then I met my wife when I was 24. We got married, we had kids, we moved to the United States again, and uh, I just never thought about it again. Today, mm. I just, I remember that, and I can tell you about <clears throat> my story of uh, consuming. A lot of people cannot talk about their past. I don't have a problem talking about my past. I know I know this is still a big problem, and, and people need to get some help to get out of it, and it's happening a lot. There's people like myself, who had a lot of potential, super competent, that cannot accomplish anything fruitful in life because they're so stuck in this particular prison that the drugs are presenting to them. So for me, 
it's kind of like one of the things that I want. I want to be able to help. When I look at somebody who's a drug addict, I look at somebody that was in my same spot many years ago. And right now, man, uh, in the last six years alone, Jeremy, uh, I have some booming businesses. I've helped people all over the world. I do seminars to thousands of entrepreneurs. I work with some of the best people that I know, Grant Cardone, Dr. Eric Berg, my dad. These are guys that I help every single day with my content, my information, my strategies. And if I would be in still in drugs, that would not even exist. Yeah. And I'm also able to provide for my family, for my mom, for my uh, the people around me, people that I care about. And uh, that's a reality. It's something that when you have that situation, it can't you you can't really perform in life. So it's important for us to have a strategy, a tool to get out of it. There's another big transition. Thanks for sharing that because that is key. And um, you know, it seems so obvious, but it's not. And it's hard to get out of the environment you're in. Um <clears throat> There's another big transition, and you, you say it almost in passing because it's just part of your past, but I, I kind of zone in on it, which is, yeah, we moved to the U.S. with no money. Okay, P anyone out there, picture this. Move to a foreign country with no money, right? It's completely foreign to most people, right? To you, that's just, yeah, that's just what we did. We moved to the U.S. with no money. I mean, that's what my grandfather did when he came from Poland, right? He moved here with, with no money. I'm thinking, what the heck do you do, right? So you move to the U.S., no money. What do you, you and your wife do at that point? Well, my wife, they had a business um, that um, it was called Econo Service. And that business, it was a family business, was built on uh, being able to cash checks. She was already in the United States. She was in Mexico temporarily. So she already had something going on when I came over here, right? Mm -hmm. um, when that business was, uh, their business model was to uh, service the immigrants that were actually uh, working on construction places and then they would just wire money to their families in Mexico. That's what they worked on. Mm. Now the economy, 2007, collapsed. So these people started fleeing, right? They started leaving because there was no job. There was no construction business. There was no, people were not getting hired anymore. None of that. So we lost the income that she had shortly after we came over here. My son was born. I had a, um, a, a six month old when I moved to the United States. Uh, and uh, he was actually um, already um, uh, starting to go to a, a, a daycare uh, so we can actually start working. And I started working for my church in which I was actually doing consulting and just helping people, etc. And there was a little bit of survival there, a couple of hundred dollars a week that I would make to be able to uh, supposedly pay for that house that I was not supposed to be able to afford. And that's how it all started for me in 2006. So what did you do after the bankruptcy? What, what did you do for work? In 2007, um, we weren't bankrupt yet. We lost the house. Mm -hmm. The process of going bankrupt went for a few years. Uh, in 2010 was when the uh, bankruptcy became final. Uh, in 2007, we lost the house. And then for a few years, we had destroyed credit. Uh, we kept on trying to survive. Uh, I had lost my job that I was doing for uh, on the church because uh, there was no way people were not coming into the church enough and uh, they were not uh, providing support to the church as much as they used to. So I didn't have any money for me to be able to uh, pay for my survival. So I had to look for other options. So I did all, I did all kinds of things. I started working on a company that we were we used to sell cell phones, Verizon cell phones. And I used to have a I don't know, $350 a week salary uh, doing this. Um, and um, I was a good salesman. I always was a good salesman. I could always figure out at least how to sell something. And then uh, at some point, we started also doing other things like my wife uh, and I uh, had a friend uh, who used to sell bed sheets on the road, which that's a little bit more of a, it, it segues into my future story of how I built my powerful million dollar business. But this friend of, our, uh, a friend of ours bed was sheets. still a partner. Yeah, bed sheets. Yeah, uh, we, he used to grab uh, twenty dollar bed sheets that um, he used to buy for ten dollars, and then these are um, not cotton bed sheets. All right, this is not this, these are not high end bed sheets. And then he used to get uh, stands and put them all over the different cities and stand there and put a big banner. And then on those big uh, tents, 
he used to sell the bed sheets for $20 and make $10 out of every bed sheet. And we saw that as an opportunity. So we did that for a while, made some money to survive, and just kept on looking for opportunities. Uh, in 2010, with the, the bankruptcy went final. And then at that point, uh, we started getting uh, my dad, his book started to sell in larger quantities in Puerto Rico. And we were presented with an opportunity. My dad wanted us to build a business in the United States with him. And even though his market was uh, the Latin market, um, there's still 50 million people that are Latin in the United States. We still at this point don't have uh, what we have today. We don't have a YouTube channel. We don't have a Facebook page. We don't have any of that stuff, right? We're not in the social media world yet. But in 2010, he presented us this opportunity. He gave us $10,000 as an initial investment to get this business uh, started. Um, it's funny because those $10,000 uh, at that point for him felt like a million dollars. It was a big, big investment. And we were very nervous about it, very nervous about it. And we took that money and we rented a very small locale. And then we started doing flyers and we used to grab flyers and send them uh, door to door. Uh, we used to go to parties. Uh, this is 2010, 2011. We used to go to parties. Uh, for example, on the New Year's Eve 2010, we went and we celebrated New Year's. We gave each other a kiss. A kiss. We went to the car together. We grabbed the flyers and we put them on every single car outside the disco. And then uh, the next day, uh, on the 2nd of January, we go to the office, we open up the office, and we get all excited waiting for those phone calls to start floating in, man. And guess what happened? Not a single phone call came in, right? The only person that actually got close to the store was the actual mailman approaching with uh, some uh, bills. Uh, nobody else was coming in. We still had no business. Uh, we were doing a lot of cold calling, trying to get people's attention. Nobody was interested. So we were struggling to get some attention, and the money was running out uh, for a while. So very, very stressful times, Jeremy, for our, uh, for our last few, for, the, for those few years, 2010, bankrupt already, 2011, trying to not eat up my dad's $10,000 investment. Uh, we had other challenges along the way. I think at one point, um, we, uh, there was a credit card that we had that um, was somehow tied in with the other business that my family, my wife's family owned. And uh, uh, that credit card supposedly had collateral with their personal credit card of my wife. And what they did was that they found a connection with the $10,000 that my dad had mm, given us. Wow. And, they, and they wiped out the, uh, the account. So then we were like, suddenly we wake up and we're like, oh my God, we don't have any money anymore. So there were like uh, moments like that. I mean, if we go back and we reverse engineer what we gone through every step of the way, I think the process of evolution started back in 2007, uh, just 12 years ago, um, with a lot of failures, more failures along the way, but guess what, man? Never, never giving up and always persisting mm. towards our next level. Yeah. You know, fast forward, when did you see a light? When did you see that there was a spark of this can work, something can work? I think that I think that in 2011, uh, it was a it was a slight spark, uh, very light. At that point, I I didn't have any entrepreneurial tendencies myself. Uh, my wife did. Uh, she was an entrepreneur. She has had several businesses already that had some of them done well before they failed, and uh, and then my dad's. Um, book was doing really well and he was actually uh, doing some motion the economy was starting to reverse itself doing better and in 2011 um we had something going on at some point and then towards the end of it um we created my dad's youtube channel all right what happened was that my dad had a had a website that we created called metabolismo tv.com that website which still exists uh he had a romantic idea about it he didn't want to give YouTube business. He wanted to take away business from YouTube and have his own media channel, which is a romantic idea. And uh, that would not expand. At some point in 2011, we convinced my dad that we were going to create a YouTube channel and take advantage of the established communication lines of the world. And we created that channel and 
we started getting some traction, some people to watch the videos, to pay attention to the content. And that felt like, wait a second, we might have something here. We might have something special here. In 2012, it started developing and we started getting a lot more attention. And now we had a thousand subscribers on YouTube. And I was like, oh my God, look at that. We got a thousand subscribers on YouTube. And we started getting a phone call here and there in the United States. Hey, we're following Frank Suarez, Metabolismo TV on YouTube, and we want to find out about his products because we have a supplement brand at this point. And that started showing indications that we had potential. Still, at this point, my wife is the one handling that business. I just want to make sure that I somehow get some money so I can survive. I had a job. Um, and what I was helping my my church still at that point. I came back to help my church and as a um, what they call a counselor, all right, which I s deliver some of the services of the uh, of, of the organization. So I, I had some survival doing that, and um, but at this point I didn't want to build a business. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. I wanted my dad and my wife to build it and to make my life easier. That was my viewpoint. In 2012, uh, I started taking over the channels and uh, I started getting obsessed about it because um, I understood that the world was changing and uh, the things are very different and people had their phones with them all the time and they were consuming videos on YouTube and not on TV as much and people were not opening up magazines or um, newspaper subscriptions. They were plummeting and I started learning about that and I and I uh, realized that I had to do something about it. So for me, it became a no brainer that there was an opportunity and I started helping my dad more and took over his YouTube channel. And shortly after, uh, I started learning about the Amazon e-commerce opportunity. And um, and that was the thing that, uh, the first thing that we started with was that original bed sheets idea that I had told you about. And we grabbed that idea and uh, we put it on the online world and this business, uh, with a lot of work, a lot of uh, application of knowledge, a lot of learning every single day, um, I would even say obsessive implementation and learning, uh, we started generating $600,000 in sales monthly within its first 18, year, mm -hmm. 18 months. So it was a big deal. So it was a combination of both things. And then by 2014, I had a booming Amazon business and my dad's channel started to explode. And then at that point, we celebrated uh, in 2014, we celebrated, it was five years ago now, um, we celebrated 50,000 subscribers on YouTube in mm. 2014, two years into the channel creation, uh, almost three years, uh, now doing uh, one video every other day, and uh, we were doing almost four videos a week, usually, and uh, now we have 50,000 subscribers, and then at the um, beginning of 2015, we broke 100,000 and we did a huge event in Puerto Rico to celebrate 100,000 and that felt like a big, big deal. So now we're taking off. 100,000 subscribers, we're taking off. Uh, again, it's all about attention, Jeremy, right? So if we capture attention, we can earn more income. It's as simple as that. That's the thing that people don't understand. They take for granted, right? We have platforms today that we can use to capture attention more than anybody else in history had. We have platforms today that my grand father didn't have access to. Uh, my grandfather uh, could only work nine to five and he didn't, didn't have an online uh, uh, signal. He didn't have a, a cell phone device to work and he didn't have staff to work around the world for him. We have all of it. We have online world, laptops, cell phones and staff all over the world that can work for us seven days a week. And we have potential for pressing a couple of buttons and reaching the entire world, which is something that most people, I will tell you, Jeremy, they take it for granted. The fact that you can actually press a couple of buttons on your computer and have access to uh, what Facebook reported as 2.38 billion active people on their platforms. Imagine that. You can press a few buttons and reach all of them. Sure, it's gonna cost you a lot of money, right? Advertising was. Uh, advertising wise, but hey, if you want to reach 100,000 people, if you want to reach a million people, you can press a couple of buttons and access them. So that's what I obsessed about, Jeremy. I obsessed about uh, learning the e-commerce world and making my dad a social media superstar and doing those things uh, led me to $170 million in revenue over the last six years alone. So, Manuel, um, two things. One, 
um, I want to talk about Amazon to social media. Okay. Um, what, you know, you've had um, an evolution in, in Amazon and e-commerce and you've uh, launched several successful brands on there. What advice do you have for people? What's working well now uh, as far as Amazon goes? Uh, it's funny that you asked me that today. Do you have a lot of Amazon listeners, Jeremy? Yeah, there's there's Amazon listeners for sure. Okay, it is um, April 29. Um, as, as, of, as, of, as I'm recording this right now, uh, the last few days, uh, there's been a uh, cracking down by Amazon of uh, people using deep discounts to rank their products on Amazon. That era of deep discounts is gone. It's over. Unless you want to jeopardize your Amazon accounts. I sure as heck don't want to do that. I work really hard to have what I have. It's been a lot of years of work. And um, uh, we need to understand that the platform has changed. So I can tell you right now, anybody that's listening to this, after this date that I just mentioned right now, that Amazon promotions with discounts, uh, with deep discounts, what is a deep discount? 50, 70, 90% off? Those promotions are over. They're not going to help you get visibility anymore. And if you do them, Amazon is actually in inserting an algorithm update that uh, it's going to help them find sellers that are trying to manipulate ranking with these strategies. All right. So let me tell you what I am seeing, because I am very, very knee deep into this social media world and Amazon world. What I'm seeing is actually quite, quite powerful. And it's an opportunity for those people that understand them. If you guys are here and you're an Amazon seller, I think you can consider yourself to be lucky. There's one thing that I talk about on my seminars, and it's a quote by Seneca that talks about what does it mean to be lucky, where, where preparation meets opportunity, right? Um, if you are prepared and you get an opportunity, you take advantage of it. Let me tell you what Amazon wants right now. Amazon wants traffic, people, real human beings coming from existing social media platforms, not from uh, ranking services, not from third-party softwares, not from anywhere else. What they want is for you to send them real human beings to purchase products on their platform. And if you do that, you're going to win the game like nobody else. First and foremost, because nobody else knows how to do that. Jeremy, the opportunity is so ripe for anybody out there that has a business. Um, there's 300 million registered companies on the planet. 300 million. Only 5% of them have invested in Facebook advertising. 5% of the registered businesses on the world have invested on the greatest and biggest media company, not social media company, media company on the planet. Facebook is no longer the biggest social media. Facebook is no longer a fad. Facebook is the greatest single media organization on the planet, whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter if you like it. It doesn't matter if you think Facebook is the devil. Your opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't count. It is what it is. Eight out of 10 human beings are actively using the platform. No matter what happened with this whole um, Cambridge Analytica scandal, Mark Zuckerberg attack on Congress. Guys, just look at the numbers. Just look at them. The last two quarters that Facebook reported should be enough for you to know that you're on a winner. Facebook. Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp have taken over communication platforms on the planet and they are growing by leaps and bounds. So you either sit on the sidelines and complain about it or you jump on the train and ride the wave because the reality is that it's not stopping just because you have a problem with the platform. It's not about that. It's about if you have a business, whether you have an Amazon brand, an e-commerce brand, a brick and mortar, a service, a business to business, I need you to understand that people, your customers, are using the platform. And if you put your message in front of them, eventually, with persistence, you can win them. So for ranking purposes, I actually, this is something that I'm doing actively, Jeremy. If I wanna get to the, towards the top of the Amazon search results, I am using a combination of Facebook, Messenger, and Amazon. And we are exploding on every single brand that we touch. If we do that, and if we do that actively, we are giving Amazon the signals that they want. They want real marketing. 
They don't want tricks and tips, and they don't want uh, black hat strategies. They want you to send them real people. It's, it's actually quite obvious, right? Amazon, Google, and Facebook yeah. have built, they have built the three most powerful algorithms on the planet. Sooner or later, they were going to figure it out. And guess what? They have figured it out. Yeah, totally. And I interviewed, it's funny because it works offline too, right? I, I interviewed uh, one of the founders of Yes Two Carrots. I think they've sold the company since then, but they went you know, worldwide, nationwide in all Walgreens. And the way they did it is they got on Walgreens.com. They wanted to get into Walgreens. And what they did, they started to send, like do email marketing and, and social media marketing, paid marketing, and send those people to the stores to buy out their stock. And what do the what do the stores do? They buy more of their stock, and they want to release a nationwide. And so, <laughs> he talks about what they did to. It's not really hacking the system. It's just sending them customers and showing there's a demand, but they are taking it in their own hands instead of it happening naturally, right? Yeah, it's it's not niche related, right? It's just happening all across. It's all about that word, right? It's an attention, right? If you can capture attention, you can grow your business. Doesn't matter what your business is. Now, granted. You there is a learning curve to it, and that's where most people actually lose. And that's the one thing that I would tell anybody that wants to learn about this, Jeremy, is that you have to understand that being good in this whole social media strategy requires not pressing a boost button, not giving a hundred dollars for somebody to advertise in your behalf, literally you learning how it works and what is the strategy that works on it because Facebook. Instagram, they are not platforms for you to sell stuff. They are, they do sell like crazy, but they are platforms to build communities, to engage with people, to provide value. And it's just a, basically like, what is the simplest analogy that I can give you? Um, yeah. If you have, a, if you have, it's a like bucket, walking up to someone in a dinner party, right? We always talk about this, right? You walk up to the dinner party and you say, "Hey, how are you doing?" A normal conversation. As opposed to trying to sell, the, hey, man, you know, nice to me. I'm, you know, I want to sell you this uh, fertilizer for your lawn. And it just is so out of the the normal conversation, right? And then you have to learn how to build um, on Facebook. There's something that we are using a lot, uh, which has been used forever on the marketing world. The term is called retargeting. Or you can call it remarketing if you want. Um, and that basically what you do is that you uh, have a bucket of fish. And that bucket, you start filling it with fish in it. So how do you fill that bucket uh, with fish? You put content out there. What is content? It's videos, images, articles, podcasts, uh, audio clips. That's what you do. That content brings people, quote unquote, AKA fish into your actual bucket. Why? Because we have uh, digital footprints that are being given to us, thank God, by these platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube will do that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big YouTube guy. I'm a big believer. I've been building my dad since the beginning. I work on Grant's, uh, Grant Cardone's and Dr. Berg's and all those YouTube channels. But I'm obsessed with opportunity, man. I'm obsessed with where can I put in the least amount of money and get the most out? It's as simple as that. It's a very simple common sense equation. If I put in $10, where can I get my greatest return, right? YouTube is no longer there. YouTube was there many years ago, but today it requires a lot of energy to get it there just because it's crowded and it's competition. So right now what you do is that you build audiences, you grab that bucket of fish and you pour fish in it. So um, you do a video and you do an image and you do an article and then you keep on putting it out there. And then on the Facebook business manager, for those of you guys that don't understand anything about it, you go to business.facebook.com and you can uh, create a business manager account. If you're doing Facebook ads and you're pressing the boost button, you're doing it incorrectly, uh, but you go to business manager, and, uh, and that's how you set up the whole strategy from the top. Uh, I do I did develop a series of courses uh, that are going to give you some basics on that. I will tell you, Jeremy said a, a, a website link at the beginning. I don't think that's the right one. I'll correct them, Jeremy, because you said Manuel Suarez training.com forward slash mini courses. I believe it's Manuel Suarez.com 
forward slash mini courses. Yeah, manualsforus.com right. slash mini courses. Oh, yeah. Okay. So just for you guys uh, that were that listen to that link, that's probably not going to work uh, for you guys. Right? Manuel Suarez Training. Yeah. Dot com forward slash meeting courses. I can probably yeah. program the other one. We'll but link it up. We'll link it up in the very beginning. So yeah, we'll but have that there link, is the yeah. basics there on that. I developed a little course that, that teaches you the basics of the Facebook business manager. But on the business manager, there's a section called audiences in which you can create audiences. So people that are engaging with your Instagram profile, with your Facebook page that watch your videos, that uh, comment on your on your videos, that engage with you, that visit your websites, and you build audiences. So now, instead of having a hundred fish, uh, if you actually try to fish on a lagoon with a hundred fish, your potential is a hundred fish if you get lucky, right? But if now you go to a, a lake that has ten thousand fish on it, well, now guess what? You can fish a lot more. So it's very simple. So through your content, through your value, which is what I focus on, you can get more people on that uh, particular lake, on that bucket. And now you have a greater chance of being able to bring in more business towards your brand. But it does take time and energy. And that's where more people, most people, that's why entrepreneurship is not for everybody, Jeremy, because not everybody has the, the, the willingness to go through the process, the sweat, and the heavy energy to be able to determine uh, how to get a, a profitable, successful business. If you do that, then you can win in the end. And that's why entrepreneurship is so good because you can buy freedom, freedom to do what you want, right? Freedom to not do the things that you don't want to do. And that's what I like about entrepreneurship. I can be here in the middle of a Monday night, uh, Monday uh, afternoon talking to you. Um, I can, and this weekend I was, fly, I was flying to Las Vegas to do a seminar. Uh, you can be wherever you want to be and do whatever you want to do if you build a successful, profitable business. And that's the beauty of it. Thanks, Manuel. You know, that you break it down and make it sound so, uh, you know, you can clearly see the path, right? So I appreciate that because it seems sometimes like a black box, right? Um, I know we have a few minutes left. So um, one last question is about the content, right? Because to get those people in, in, in like you talk about it, attention grabbing, what's working as far as attention grabbing uh, when we talk about content? Because that's ultimately delivering value to people. Right. Right. My, my favorite thing to do right now is uh, get people into the Facebook Messenger platform. That has been my favorite thing for the last couple of years. Uh, I would say a year and a half we've been going heavy at it. I have generated um, over 2 million Messenger subscribers. For any of you guys that don't know what a Messenger channel is, uh, think about Messenger in the same way that you think about email. Same way, except that it has been taking steroids and has been uh, overdosed with steroids over the last two years. So instead of having 10% open rates, you are getting 90% open rates. Instead of getting 2% click-through rates, you are getting 20% click for rates. And that's what Messenger is. So what I'm doing is that I am building audiences. Facebook is a platform that you have to be quick, all right? Don't try to do a one hour webinar on it and try to get attention on, on, on it. Don't do that. If you wanna get um, people to register to your webinar, fine. If you wanna get people to come into your Messenger, yes. If you wanna get people to generate uh, leads, absolutely, you can do all of that. But don't try to get them to consume long videos. YouTube, I was just looking at this morning at um, Precisely. Do you know who Dr. Eric Berg is, uh, Jeremy? He's a health professional, right? The, That's uh, right. He's, yeah. he's a chiropractor. He's, uh, he's about to cross uh, 3 million YouTube subscribers, all right? When I started working with him, he had a couple hundred thousand mm -hmm. a few years mm -hmm. ago, and he has taken off to the next level. Um, I was looking at his account uh, on YouTube and looking at the Facebook accounts, uh, both of them, to compare them. Uh, in the last 28 days, he generated 77 million uh, minutes watched hmm. on YouTube, okay? Versus 2.5 minute, million minutes watched. What does that tell me? On YouTube, people are consuming content. They sit down and they watch videos for hours and hours and hours. On Facebook, there is just too much content, that feed is too crowded, so you have to be really fast. 
Imagine that. And not only that, let me tell you one thing. We invest a lot more money for Dr. Berg on Facebook advertising than on YouTube advertising. Why? Because Facebook is a great platform to re-engage people that are engaging on email, uh, YouTube, Messenger, all over the place and get them to convert. But it's not the best platform to get them to consume content. So what you got to do is that you can actively, you, had a, you have to actively focus on getting them out of Facebook, out of Facebook. How do you get them out of Facebook? You can do many things. Uh, don't put YouTube links to your videos. Don't do that because Facebook doesn't want, want you to do that. But what you can do is that you can generate messenger subscribers. How do you set that up? There's a platform that I use, which I'm a big advocate for, called ManyChat, M-A-N-Y-C-H-A-T.com. That's basically your email marketing platform for Messenger. Uh, think about ManyChat in the same way that you think about Infusionsoft, ActiveCampaign, MailChimp, Constant Contact, etc. It is a platform that connects your Facebook Messenger with your um, own handling of these people. You can build sequences menus. If you guys want to have some examples of what you can do on that, you can check out my channel. If you go to m.me forward slash the ninja marketer, it's going to send you to my messenger channel, how I edu educate on that channel, how I do mini courses, trainings, etc. If you go to m.me forward slash Grand Cardone fan, that's a channel that we built for Grand Cardone that does a lot of education and that uh, shows people how to um, do real estate, how to sell, uh, how to invest wisely. And by doing so, we can now sell to these people forever because it's all about value, 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 and then sell. So the Facebook strategy, Jeremy, is basically this. Figure out your message, how your content, your information can make somebody else better. That could be inspiration, that could be education, that could be entertainment. That could be know-how, how to do something. Do it yourself. That could be like what you're doing, Jeremy. You're interviewing other people of value for the society. That is really valuable because somebody listens to this and they're like, wow, idea, idea, idea. So that's actually something that is a message. So you grab that message and you put it out there. And not only that, you start investing dollars in getting people to see that content. And when you do that, you start building audiences. And then those audiences, you bring them into your world by extracting them from Facebook and bringing them into Messenger, your email marketing platforms, et cetera. I'm not a big fan of email right now. I still believe in it, but, but it really does bother me, Jeremy. Every time that I log in to my Infusionsoft account and I see that my broadcast got 14% open rates, 12% open rates, because I work really hard for those people really hard to get them in. So when I can see only 14 out of 100 opening them, it bothers me. And then I go to ManyChat and I see 90% of them open up the messages and that gets me excited. So it's not about, I hate email, I like this. It's just the data. Look at the numbers, showing, yeah. It's showing me what we have in front of us, that's all. First of all, thank you. This has been fantastic. I wanna point people towards manualsuarez.com slash mini courses. You know, any other places we should point people towards online and who is ideal to work with you? Right. Um, Jeremy, I have a, uh, a podcast myself, too. Uh, it's called the uh, Facebook Marketing Ninja podcast. Um, it, if you search for Facebook marketing on uh, all the major powerful platforms that we have today, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, etc., you should be able to find me within the first few results. If you go to anchor.fm forward slash Facebook Ninja, uh, that's basically the link that takes you directly to the platform. Um, I have, uh, I'm con I put content on social media every day, on Instagram, on Instagram TV, which by the way, we haven't talked about, but it's a hot platform right now. And uh, Instagram is pushing it really hard. Uh, on Facebook, I put content every single day. If you go to facebook.com forward slash the Ninja Marketer, that's my Facebook page. Uh, my YouTube channel is, is still there. I post videos there every day. Um, you can search for Manuel Suarez and you will see me on, on YouTube. And um, just stay connected because uh, that's my obsession. My obsession is to help you guys understand uh, how to take advantage of these modern platforms. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity. We're not late in the game. It's just getting started. It's basically like uh, the gold rush 
of California, Sacramento, 1948, right? 1848, all over again, in which people are uh, trying to plant also on uh, their, their flags, uh, their territories. Uh, it's just that right now we have these uh, digital territories that we're trying to fight for. But there's a lot of opportunities, especially if you have a message that should be heard by people. If you have a message that you know is going to help somebody else make their lives better, influence their lives somehow, whether that's because you have a brand, a product, a service, a brick and mortar, or whatever, then you have an opportunity to put yourself in front of the masses, in front of the billions of people, just by understanding how these platforms work. The middleman that you need to, uh, that you needed before is no longer needed, right? The uh, PR agency, the newspaper, the magazine, uh, even the radio. You got Jeremy now, right? You, we got, we go direct to the listeners now, to the actual, we go direct to the host, we go direct to the radio stations, and we consume the content at our own will. It's on-demand content. That's what's happening today. Mm. So things have changed, and we all need to change with them. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was on a dorm room figuring out how to change, uh, how to create this platform just to change the college, not even the world. Right now, they has, this thing has changed the whole world. And um, look at their earnings, man. Last week, they reported their earnings. They are taking over the world. No matter what, turn off, delete Facebook campaign. Let me tell you something. That campaign did not work. Whatever happened did not work. It, it's funny, right? Because uh, you see uh, people complaining that Facebook didn't work for them. And at the same time, you see people complaining that uh, Donald Trump won the elections because of social media. So it's very contradictory, right? Like, uh, why would you say that Facebook didn't work uh, for your business, but then it worked to um, select a winner to uh, lead our democracy in the United States? It doesn't make any sense, right? It's all about you figuring out how it works and what you do in it. And despite any failures that you have, picking yourself up and just redo it again and go over again until you find something successful. And maybe, hey, you can find yourself in a similar spot as I am right now, which uh, I can tell you that I've been very successful over the last few years, and I wasn't. In 2013, 2012, I was not yet. In 2010, I looked at my wife before we uh, finalized our bankruptcy, and I said, baby, um, I don't have enough money to buy diapers for a kid. I'm going to try to find a solution. Don't worry. I'll figure this out. At that point, I had nothing. My dad had nothing at that point. We were still basically trying to figure out how to rebuild ourselves. So to come from that point to where I'm at today without an inheritance, without winning the lotto or nothing, trust me, no matter where you are at, you can always get yourself to the next level, Jeremy. And that's the truth. Amen. Thanks, Manuel. I appreciate it. I want to be the first one to thank you. Check out manuelsuarez.com slash mini courses. Fantastic. All right, thank you very much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.